Prologue. May 1868. The young woman set the basket on the front step of the orphanage and wiped a tear from her eye. She didn't want to give up her baby, but with her husband dead, and no family left, there was nothing else she could do. She'd come back for her when she could, and they would be a family. She knocked on the door and hurried away, watching from behind a tree as a plump matronly woman picked up her little girl and held her to her shoulder, patting her back lovingly. Yes, her baby would be well taken care of here. She hurried off. Tomorrow was her first day as a maid cleaning for a rich woman in Boston. She really had to hurry or she'd be late. Asterisk. January 1885. Andrew Harvey stared down into his mother's coffin. They'd buried his father just four days before, and now his mother was gone too. He looked at his younger siblings. He was only twenty. How could he be expected to take care of them all? He couldn't send them to an orphanage, though. No, they would stay together. The ranch could sustain them. His younger siblings, Francis, Arthur, and Matilda, were all weeping uncontrollably. He wanted to shake them. What did they have to cry about? He was the one with three mouths to feed and more responsibility than he could handle. He stood stoically as the men and women of their community shook their hands and offered condolences. You let me know if you need anything, an older woman who lived two miles from their ranch said. Andrew nodded. Yes, ma'am. He knew he wouldn't though. The four siblings would make it on their own. They weren't charity cases and never had been. Why, Mama would roll over in her grave if she thought they were out begging. Chapter 1 March 1886 Francis Harvey was in town buying supplies when he spotted the newspaper. He picked it up and flipped through it. They didn't get to town often, except for church, so they didn't really know what was going on with the world. In the want ads, he spotted an ad that he couldn't stop staring at. Are there too few women around you? Do you need a wife? Send a letter to Elizabeth Miller at 300 Rock Creek Road, Beckham, Massachusetts. Mail order brides available. Small matching fee applies. Francis read through the advertisement once more, wondering what Andrew would do if he sent off a letter to this woman for him. Things were bad at home, though. They were living off of beef jerky and whatever bread they could buy from the mercantile. Matilda would pick berries, and they'd have those for dessert. They needed someone to cook and clean for them. He couldn't do it. Maddie needed someone to teach her. So did he and Arthur, for that matter. He went into the mercantile and asked for a pencil and paper, deciding to do it while he had his confidence up. How to word the letter. He sat down on a bench in front of the mercantile and quickly wrote out his family's situation, explaining what he wanted in a sister-in-law, but said wife and signed his brother's name. Yes, that would do nicely. He walked it back into the mercantile for the owner. George, to post. It was the only post office in nowhere, Texas. He knew it was a silly name for a town, but it was the only one they had. Hopefully potential brides wouldn't be afraid to travel to a place called nowhere. Asterisk. Tracy Beckham had been found on the orphanage steps when she was just a few weeks old. There was a note in the basket she was left in that said, This is Tracy. Please take care of my beautiful baby. I cannot. I will return for her as soon as I can. Signed, Her Loving Mother. Because of that note, no one had been willing to adopt Tracy. The orphanage had always waited for her mother to come back for her. Now that Tracy was almost 18, it was time for her to find her own way in the world. On her way home from school, she stopped at the mercantile to check the bulletin board to see if there were any new advertisements for jobs. She looked through them. Looked like all the same ones she always saw. Someone needed a farm hand. One family needed a cook, but they had a terrible reputation. There were no other jobs for women. 
none. There was the advertisement for a mail-order bride that was there every week, but she wasn't that desperate, was she? She pulled out her slate and jotted down the address. Yes, she was that desperate. She didn't have much longer before she had to move out of the orphanage. Her time was up. She left the mercantile and walked the short distance to Rock Creek Road. She needed to see Elizabeth Miller there. She knew some of the volunteers who had helped at the orphanage over the years had ended up being mail-order brides, and she'd heard no horror stories. It couldn't be that bad, could it? Tracy stopped in front of the huge house with the address she'd jotted down. This couldn't be right, could it? She checked her slate again before marching up to the door and knocking. She held her breath as she waited, more nervous than she ever remembered being. What if Elizabeth Miller told her she'd make a terrible mail-order bride? She didn't know why she would, because Tracy was good at cleaning, cooking, and minding children. What more did a woman need to be a bride? She straightened her skirt as she waited for someone to come to the door. A tall man in his twenties answered the door. He had blonde hair and sparkling blue eyes and looked to be of Scandinavian descent. May I help you? He asked, very politely, but not in the cultured tones Tracy expected of a butler. I'm here to see Elizabeth Miller, please. The man stepped aside and invited her inside. This way, please. He led her to the end of the hall and opened the last door on the left. Miss Miller? There is someone here to see you. Elizabeth looked up with a smile. She was much younger than what Tracy had expected, not much older than she was herself. When she got to her feet and hurried across the room, her welcoming smile removed the last of Tracy's fears. I'm Tracy Beckham. Sit down. Elizabeth looked at her butler. Bernard, would you mind bringing us tea and some cookies, please? Of course not, Miss Miller. Tracy took the seat she was offered on the sofa and smiled at the young woman who had returned to her spot at her desk. I'm here about the advertisement for a mail-order bride. Elizabeth nodded, looking her up and down carefully. Tracy wanted to hide the patches on her worn clothes, but there was no way to do that. Her long red hair was neatly brushed and styled and her clothes were clean. She couldn't do more than that. How old are you, Tracy? I'll be 18 next month. At least that's what we think. Tracy knew she was going to have to explain that statement, and she really didn't want to have to. You think? I was left on the doorstep of the orphanage here in town when I was just an infant. They're not sure how old I was, but I'll either be 18 this month or next. Tracy wasn't ashamed of being an orphan, but she certainly wasn't proud of it either. This woman lived in a beautiful house in the best part of Beckham. Is that how you got your last name? They named you after the town? Tracy nodded. Mrs. Spivy, the woman who cares for us, picked it out for me. My birth name was Tracy, though. It was written on the note attached to my basket. I see. Elizabeth frowned for a moment, before turning to her desk. Let's see if we can find someone for you to marry. We don't match up women who are under 18, but since you'll obviously be over 18 before I could send you out, it doesn't really matter. Tracy waited while the other woman sorted through a stack of letters on her desk, finally pulling one from the pile. I think this one will suit you best. Read it and let me know what you think. Tracy reached out and took the letter, her hand shaking slightly. Was she actually touching a piece of paper her future husband had touched? Tracy spent a great deal of time lost in books and was a hopeless romantic. What she wanted to find more than anything was a man who would love her with everything inside him. Was there any way this man, whose name she hadn't even read yet, would be that man? Her eyes drifted down the page, and she read the words he'd written. Dear Bride, I'm a 21-year-old man who owns a ranch near Nowhere, Texas. My parents died a little over a year ago and left me with three younger siblings to take care of. 
I love them all, but I'm having trouble being both mother and father to them. My 16-year-old brother, Francis, is a huge help to me, but he can't parent the others either. I need someone who doesn't mind cooking, cleaning, and all the things that come with keeping house. I have two brothers, and they help me on the ranch, but my sister, Matilda, is only seven and she needs to be taken under a woman's wing. If you like children and don't mind moving to a place called Nowhere, TX, I'd love to hear from you. We don't have a whole lot, but we certainly have enough for one more. I'd like a woman who is in the 18 to 20 age range and doesn't mind working hard. If this describes you, please write me soon. Sincerely, Andrew Harvey. Tracy read the words again before setting the letter down. She liked the idea of having children to take care of right off, and then maybe having some of her own. She was used to helping out with the younger children at the orphanage and cooking for large numbers of people. It wouldn't hurt her one little bit to just keep doing what she'd been doing since she was old enough to help out. Andrew seems just right for me. What now? Elizabeth smiled, her blue eyes sparkling with joy. Tracy had never met anyone who genuinely loved their job as Elizabeth obviously did. Well, you need to write him back. Tell him all about yourself. We'll get a letter back in around one month, and he'll either say yes or no. If it's yes, there will be money included along with a train ticket. If no, we'll find someone else. Elizabeth winked at Tracy. It's never been no. Tracy accepted the pencil and paper Elizabeth offered her and started writing, explaining about herself as well as she could. When she was finished, she folded the letter in half and handed it to Elizabeth. How will I know when you get a response? I'll come by the orphanage with it. Bernard came into the room then with the tea and cookies. Tracy curled her legs under her and nibbled while she talked to the other girl. I wonder what Texas is like. Elizabeth grinned and took a sip of her tea. My sister went there as a mail-order bride a couple of years back. She would answer that question with one word. Tracy raised an eyebrow. What word? Hot. Tracy giggled. I hate winter. Hot sounds pretty good to me. Susan is near Fort Worth. I'm not sure where nowhere, Texas is, though. I'm guessing, the middle of nowhere? Wherever it is, I'll finally have a family that I belong with. That's important to me. Elizabeth smiled. It would be important to an orphan. I was happy to escape from my family for a bit. I have eleven brothers and sisters. Tracy's eyes widened. That's a lot of siblings. It is. Elizabeth's face turned serious. How long will you be able to stay in the orphanage? Tracy shrugged. Another two months at most. They give us a little bit of extra time when we need it, but the house is always full. I'll get this mailed off first thing in the morning then. That sounds good. Thank you for all your help. Tracy got to her feet and smiled at the older girl. I'll see you soon, I hope. Elizabeth saw her out and stood at the door watching her go. She turned to Bernard. See what you can find out about Andrew Harvey in Nowhere, Texas. I think we're going to send our youngest bride ever there. I'll see to it. Bernard stepped away quickly, going to write his own letters. Asterisk. Francis went into town with only Matilda in tow one afternoon in late April. The two of them had been going to town together every Monday since he'd sent off the letter to Massachusetts. He needed to make sure he read the letter before Andrew saw it. Francis had tried to bring up the idea of a mail-order bride to Andy, suggesting logically that a wife would be the answer to a lot of their problems. Andy had flat-out refused to even consider it. A wife wouldn't solve my problems. She'd be just one more person looking to me for the answers, and I just don't feel like I have any. Francis, tried again. Don't be so hard on yourself. You've done a great job with all of us since Ma and Pa died. 
Andy had looked at him in shock. Have you seen the state of this house? Ma would roll over in her grave if she knew how dirty this place was. He was ashamed of how dirty he'd let it get, but he didn't know how to clean. At first, he'd told his younger brothers that any idiot could do it, and then he'd tried himself, proving any idiot could not do it. You're doing your best. You need a wife to help. I need a wife like I need to be shot in the head. Andy had stopped from the room then, not saying another word. Francis stopped the wagon in front of the mercantile and helped Maddie down. Whether Andy knew he needed a wife or not, they all needed someone to mother them. Especially Maddie. He would send for the bride, and Andy would marry her when he was told about her arrival. He felt too strongly about his responsibilities to do otherwise. When he walked into the mercantile, the owner called out to him. Got a letter for Andy, Francis. You want it? Francis rushed over and took the letter, hoping it would be the one he'd been waiting for. Thank you, George. George smiled. No problem. Francis rushed out and sat on the bench in front of the store, completely forgetting that Maddie was with him. He tore the letter open and read it. Dear Andrew, my name is Tracy Beckham and I'm going to be 18 next month. I live in an orphanage here in Massachusetts, and I've learned all the wifely skills there. I love to cook and am quite good at it. I don't particularly like to clean, but I'm good at that as well. I can sew and have been tending the younger children in the orphanage for years. I feel like I would be able to help you raise your siblings. I have red hair and green eyes. I would very much like to complete your family. I can come whenever you want me. Sincerely, Tracy Beckham. Francis's face split into a grin as he read the words. He knew for a fact that Andy was partial to red heads, so he felt that it was a sign that this was the girl who would be the perfect sister-in-law for him. He rushed into the store and borrowed a pencil again, pulling the money he needed to send out of his pocket and tucking it into the letter. He ran across the street to the train station and bought a ticket from Beckham, Massachusetts, to nowhere. Tracy would be on a train bound for nowhere any day. He rushed back to the mercantile and gave George the sealed letter. George was both the mercantile owner and the postmaster of nowhere. He was also the mayor. Of course, with a town the size of nowhere, there just weren't enough men around to do all the jobs that needed to be done. Francis rushed back to Maddie, and the two of them bought the goods they needed. They were there for the same things every single week. Bread, crackers, and beef jerky. No one in the family had even attempted to cook since Ma had died, so they ate whatever they could find that didn't need to be prepared. Francis, can I get a piece of stick candy? Please? Francis smiled at his sister. She'd been calling him Fuances since she was tiny and couldn't say the R sound. Now it was just habit, but he liked it coming from her lips. Only if you promise not to tell the others. Most of the money he had on him had been sent to Massachusetts. He was glad he'd thought to bring extra that morning. Just one piece. Maddie happily looked through the different kinds of candy and selected a peppermint stick. They bought the other things they needed and started the long drive back to the ranch. They lived a good hour's drive from town, and he knew it was a waste to make it every week and lose a half day's work, but they couldn't really keep going without bread, and none of them even knew where to begin making it. Tracy will know. She'll fix everything. Asterisk. It was mid-May, and school would be out soon. This was her last year and Tracy knew that she had little time left at the orphanage. She'd been there for a full 18 years. So many of the babies that came and got adopted, but the letter that had been attached to her basket kept her from being placed with a new family. When she was young, she'd wondered if her mother ever thought about her and when she would come. As she'd gotten older, she'd forgotten to hope for her mother to come and done everything she could to be wanted and relied on there in the orphanage. She wanted to dawdle on her way home, 
but she knew that there was strawberry jam to be canned, and she was the oldest girl in the house, so it would be her responsibility to help. She would do it without a single complaint, because acting badly would only get her kicked out sooner. She was on borrowed time already. When she opened the kitchen door, the first thing she saw was Elizabeth sitting at the table, a sealed letter in front of her. Tracy said nothing as she dove for the letter, picking it up and reading it immediately. Dear Tracy, you sound like you are the perfect wife for me, but more importantly, the perfect sister-in-law for my younger siblings. I have enclosed a small amount of money to help you make the trip and a train ticket. I can't wait to see you at the train station. Yours, Andrew. Tracy's smile lit up her entire face. She was always a pretty girl, but when she smiled, she became truly beautiful. She handed the money to Elizabeth, not sure how much was hers for her services and how much was her own. Elizabeth gave most of the money back to her. When do you leave? She asked. Tracy looked down at the ticket. It says May 14th. Why, that's tomorrow. Elizabeth smiled. Let's go get you packed then. Tracy shook her head. I can't. It's my job to help with the jam. She rushed to Mrs. Spivey's side. Over her shoulder she said, I'll do it later. There's not much to do. Elizabeth looked undecided for a moment before she smiled at Mrs. Spivey. Do you have an extra apron? Mrs. Spivey looked Elizabeth up and down before nodding to a peg on the wall. Hanging there. Oh, you don't have to help, Elizabeth. Elizabeth shrugged. I don't mind. When we're done here, we can pack. An extra pair of hands will certainly speed up the process. The work did go quickly with three of them, and when they had put the lid on the last jar, Elizabeth grabbed Tracy's hand and dragged her up the stairs. Which room is yours? She asked. Tracy led Elizabeth into the girls' room. There were ten beds lined up against the walls. Tracy went to her bed and pulled a carpet bag out from under it. She quickly packed her things into the bag and stood up after snapping it shut. There. Packing is done. Elizabeth raised an eyebrow. What are you taking? Tracy shrugged. Everything I own that I'm not wearing. One extra dress for Sundays, an apron, and my Bible. She sat down on her perfectly made bed. Oh, and a nightgown, of course. Elizabeth sighed. You should take some fabric with you so you can make an extra dress once you get there. It's a different climate. You'll need some warm weather dresses. Tracy sighed. I don't know how much I'll be paying for food along my journey. I don't think I can afford to waste anything. She looked at the money that Andrew had sent. It's not very much. Elizabeth looked at it and shook her head. No, it's not. I'll buy you some fabric. She started toward the door. Come with me. I can afford it. Tracy blushed. She hated being anyone's charity case, but even more, she hated the idea of showing up for her wedding with no extra clothes at all. How would that work for her? All right. Tracy let Mrs. Spivey know where she was going, and the two of them headed for the mercantile. They spent a few minutes looking around until Tracy spotted a fabric she really liked. It was a mint green calico with tiny little flowers. She'd never wanted anything so much in her life as she wanted a pretty dress with that calico. Elizabeth picked it up and nodded. That's perfect. She ordered three yards. If you have extra, you can always make another apron or a bonnet from it. Tracy nodded, impulsively hugging the other woman. Thank you. I didn't want to go to him a pauper. Elizabeth paid, and the two of them walked back toward the orphanage. What time does your train leave tomorrow? Tracy pulled the ticket out of her drawstring purse. Ten in the morning. Elizabeth nodded. I'll meet you at the train station at half-past nine. 
That's all right. I can see myself off. Elizabeth smiled. Let me be a friend and see you off. I'll be there at half past nine. Tracy shrugged. She couldn't control the other woman. I'll be there. Tracy arrived at the train station five minutes late the following morning, and her eyes scanned the crowd for Elizabeth. No matter how much she'd protested the day before, she was glad she wasn't going to have to get on the train with no one to see her off. The morning had been difficult and chaotic, and she was glad for the change in her life. Going to Texas would be good for her. After a moment, she spotted Elizabeth and hurried through the small crowd to sit on the seat beside her. Good morning, she said, waiting for Elizabeth to notice her there. Good morning, Elizabeth said with a smile. Are you ready to go? She held up a package of brown paper tied with a string. I brought you some sandwiches to make your money stretch. Tracy took the sandwiches with a smile. Thank you. I couldn't take food away from the orphanage. There's not always enough as it is. Elizabeth nodded, understanding perfectly. We didn't always have enough growing up either. She cleared her throat for a moment as if she was thinking about how to word what she wanted to say. I just want you to know that if anything goes wrong, all you have to do is contact me, and I'll send you a train ticket, and you can come back and stay with me if necessary. What do you mean wrong? Tracy asked. What exactly was Elizabeth offering? Some men are, not good to their wives, Elizabeth began. Tracy had heard a lot of stories from the other children living in the orphanage. There was one boy there who had been put there when his father beat his mother to death and ended up in prison as a result. I know. I've heard a lot of men beat their wives. Tracy shrugged. It's a woman's cross to bear. Elizabeth shook her head adamantly. No, it's not. If someone hurts you, get out. Never allow a man to hurt you. Do you understand? Tracy nodded slowly. She'd never heard of a woman leaving a man who hit her, but it did make sense. I'll let you know if anything like that happens to me. Elizabeth looked relieved. Good. They both heard the call for the train then. She got to her feet and hugged Tracy tightly. Write to me when you get there to let me know you made it safely. I will. She leaned down to pick up her carpet bag and clutched her sandwiches in her other hand. Thank you for everything. Elizabeth smiled. I wish we'd met sooner. I think we could have become good friends. Tracy smiled. I'll write you, and we'll still become good friends. I'd like that. Tracy rushed toward the train where the conductor was calling for them again. She looked over her shoulder and waved before plunging into the train and finding her seat. Chapter 2 Francis watched as his younger siblings went to bed, wringing his hands nervously. Tracy was due to arrive in nowhere the following day and he hadn't yet gotten up the courage to tell Andy that his wife was about to arrive. As soon as Arthur went to bed, Francis turned to Andy. Do you remember when I told you I thought you should get a mail-order bride? he asked. Andy shook his head. It was a stupid idea then, and it's a stupid idea now. I'm too busy for a wife. Francis sighed. He'd have to just tell his older brother what he'd done straight out. I sent off for a bride for you, before I even suggested it. She'll be here tomorrow around two. Andy blinked a few times staring at his brother in shock. You did what? Andy, we need a woman around here. We need someone who knows how to cook and clean. We haven't eaten a home-cooked meal since Ma died. You get married then. I don't have time for a bride. Francis shook his head. She's expecting to marry you. I sent for her in your name. Why would you do that, Francis? Why on God's green earth would you think I would be okay with not only marrying a woman I'd never met, but one you chose for me? No, I won't marry her. But, Andy, she's an orphan. 
She's from Beckham, Massachusetts. She's been traveling for 10 days to get here just to marry you. An orphan? Are you kidding me? How old is she? 12? Andy could just picture his brother sending away for another child for him to care for. She's 18. She has red hair and green eyes. She likes to cook. Please, Andy, just marry her. You'll have someone to help you with the nonsense we put you through. Andy sighed as he stared at his brother. Why would he do something like that? He had enough going on just trying to make sure everyone was fed and clothed. A wife. What was he supposed to do with a wife? I'll meet her, but just to tell her I'm not going to marry her. She can get right back on that train and go back east. I don't need any woman who doesn't understand how hard ranch life is here. Francis sighed. If Andy met her, he'd marry her. He knew his big brother. Many people had told him to dump all of his younger siblings at an orphanage. You don't need to be responsible for them, they'd told him. Andy hadn't listened. He took his responsibilities seriously. He'd feel obligated to marry Tracy, just like he felt obligated to keep all of his siblings. There would be real food for dinner tomorrow night and every night thereafter. Just in time, too. If he had to eat any more beef jerky, he was going to start vomiting and never stop. Asterisk. Tracy tried to smooth her wrinkled skirt as she got off the train in Nowhere, Texas. After traveling for ten days, she was rumpled and particularly out of sorts. She was going to have to meet her future husband looking like someone who lived in the woods, not a young lady. She was mortified and hoped Andrew was forgiving. She got off the train, the only person to get off there in nowhere, and looked around her. The train pulled out before she spotted four people huddled together. She walked toward them hoping they were the Harveys, because she didn't know what she'd do otherwise. She approached them and smiled into the face of the oldest of the four. I'm Tracy. Are you Andrew? The man removed his cowboy hat and nodded, his Adam's apple bobbing as he swallowed. He had blonde hair that was longer than it should be, but Tracy could easily take care of that with a pair of scissors. Yes, I'm Andy. He looked her up and down, surprised by how pretty she was. These are my brothers, Francis and Arthur, and my sister, Matilda. Tracy smiled nodding to each of them. It's nice to meet all of you. Andy tried to find the right words to get her to wait for the next train to come and take her back east. Before he could speak, Maddie tugged on her dress. Will you teach me how to cook? My brothers say that all women know how to cook, but I don't know how, and I'm going to be a woman someday. Tracy ignored her aching body that had been on bumpy trains for altogether too long and squatted down in front of the pretty little girl whose blonde hair hung limply. It hadn't been braided or even brushed and definitely needed to be washed. I would love to teach you to cook. She leaned forward and whispered into the girl's ear, I'll teach you how to fix your hair really pretty, too. Maddie threw her arms around Tracy and hugged her. She turned to Andy and said, Can we keep her, Andy? Please? Andy frowned down at his sister and then looked at the woman in front of him. He sighed heavily, knowing he couldn't disappoint Maddie. Yes, we'll keep her. Let's go see the preacher. Maddie squealed and clapped her hands excitedly. Will you be my new mama? Tracy shook her head. I'll be your sister-in-law but you can call me Tracy. Maddie took Tracy's hand in hers. She looked at Andy expectantly. Let's go find the preacher. You said. Andy looked at Tracy, inexplicably angry with her for expecting him to marry her. Is that all you brought? He asked, nodding at the bag at her feet. She certainly wasn't trying to overwhelm them with her possessions. She nodded, blushing slightly. Orphans don't exactly have a lot of belongings. She wouldn't apologize for not having parents. He'd agreed to marry her knowing she was an orphan. 
The five of them walked down the street toward the preacher's house. Tracy was surprised that she was holding hands with Maddie and not with Andrew, but she didn't say anything about it. What could she say? She really didn't have anywhere else to go, or she'd be there. She felt a vague sense of disappointment at the way he had acted upon meeting her. She'd hoped he would at least act like he was happy to meet her, but instead he looked as if he'd rather she was anywhere else in the world. Of course, in her imagination, he'd taken one look at her and swept her into his arms, kissing her madly right there on the street. She would blush, but be so happy to finally meet him she would just smile up at him sweetly. Francis hurried to Tracy's side, linking his arm through hers. So, after the wedding, I thought we could stop at the mercantile and stock up on food. You are going to cook dinner tonight, right? Tracy looked at Francis in surprise. I guess I am. She squeezed Maddie's hand. Do you want to help me cook? Maddie nodded solemnly. We're women, so it's our job to do the cooking. I'll even help you wash the dishes. Tracy smiled down at the girl. I'd like that a lot. What do you like to cook? Maddie shrugged. I don't know. Ma didn't have time to start teaching me to cook before she died, so I've never cooked anything. I'll start teaching you to cook tonight. Would you like that? Maddie nodded with a smile. I'd like that a lot. You're going to be a good sister, aren't you? I'll do my very best. I've never been anyone's sister. It will be fun to have a family. How come you don't have a family? I have three brothers. Tracy shrugged. When I was a baby, my mama couldn't take care of me, so she left me on the doorsteps of an orphanage. She left a note with me, so everyone would know my name was Tracy, and said she'd come back for me, but I guess she never had time. Maddie clutched Tracy's hand tighter. We're your family now. Tracy smiled. I'm glad. She was amazed at how much the little girl understood her need for family and welcomed her accordingly. Andrew walked to the door of a house and knocked. An elderly gentleman came to the door. Well, hello, Andy. Good afternoon, Pastor. I was wondering if you could marry my fiancé, Tracy, and me today? He used his thumb to indicate Tracy, who was standing behind him holding his sister's hand. The older man smiled, his eyes twinkling. I'd be happy to. He looked at Tracy. It's nice to meet you. I haven't seen you at church. Oh, I'm from Massachusetts. I came here to marry Andrew. She said nothing more. She wasn't ashamed to be a mail-order bride but it wasn't the normal way to marry either. The pastor opened the door wide, inviting them all inside. Let me just get my wife, and we'll get this started. Tracy stood quietly in the parlor of the tiny house waiting for the other woman to arrive. She wished she knew what to say to Andrew to make him warm up to her, but she had no idea how to talk to a man she'd marry in a few minutes. When the pastor came back, there was a plump woman with white hair and dancing blue eyes with him. She rushed to Tracy and took her hand. It's so nice to meet you. Andy has needed a good woman for a long time. I'll do my best to be a good wife to him and a good sister to his siblings. Tracy felt as if she were making a formal vow as she said the words. I know you will. It's in your eyes. She patted Tracy's arm. The pastor stood in the center of the room. Are we ready to start? Tracy took the hint and hurried over to stand beside Andrew. Everyone had called him Andy, but she'd been thinking of him as Andrew for a month, and changing her thinking was going to be hard. She listened as the pastor talked softly about the responsibilities of a husband and wife. He added some extra words for their situation. It will be your responsibility to see that your whole family is fed. Marriage is hard enough without starting out with three extra people. Are you sure you're ready for the responsibility of raising Maddie and Arthur? 
He didn't add Francis, because Francis was already mostly grown. Yes, sir. I am. Tracy hoped she was telling the truth. Honestly, she felt perfectly capable of cooking and cleaning and mothering, but making Andrew happy seemed like an insurmountable task. The oldest brother hadn't smiled yet. She could understand him feeling like he had a huge burden on his shoulders, but he looked almost angry. After her agreement, he went into the typical marriage vows. Once she'd agreed to take Andrew as her husband and he'd agreed to take her as wife, the preacher said he could kiss his bride. Tracy blushed. She'd never been kissed, and the first time would be here in front of all these people? Andy leaned down and brushed his lips across hers. He may not want a wife, but she was pretty, and now that he had one, he'd make the most of her. He kept this kiss brief, knowing the others were looking. He didn't want to have to explain to Maddie why he'd kissed his new wife for so long. Tracy was a pretty woman, and even if she was a terrible wife in every other way, she'd be a joy to bed. Tracy felt tingling all the way to her toes when his lips brushed against hers. She was so happy she'd answered his letter and that she would be his wife and not some other woman. Now that they'd kissed, she knew that she had done the right thing. He would be a good husband to her, and they would have a dozen children, just like in one of her books. She smiled up at him, tentatively, hoping he would smile in return, but he was already facing the pastor. She didn't mind, though, because in her mind, they were already living happily ever after with their children on his ranch. He would carry her over the threshold and treat her like a princess. He'd even hire someone to do the cleaning, so she could just cook and so the task she enjoyed. Thank you, pastor. Andy shook hands with the older man, wondering what had just happened. Why had kissing Tracy made him feel so strongly? He'd kissed a few other girls, but had never felt anything like the jolt of electricity that had just gone through him. He couldn't let her have power over him. He'd seen the power his mother had over his father, and it wasn't pretty. A man should never let a woman control him. We'll see you on Sunday. Andrew led the way out of the house with Tracy following behind again. She wondered if he'd ever walk beside her. Maybe he needed to be taught how to treat a wife. She could work on that with him. Maddie clung to Tracy's hand all the way back to the wagon. Tracy waited for Andrew to assist her into the seat, but when he didn't, she climbed up herself. Maybe no one had ever taught him any kind of manners? Francis, Arthur, and Maddie climbed into the back of the wagon while she sat on the seat at the front with Andrew. How far is it to the ranch? she asked. About an hour. Andy didn't offer any more information. He wasn't going to become any closer to the woman beside him than absolutely necessary. She was there to help him raise his younger siblings, not for him to fall in love with. Tracy peppered him with questions as they drove, and he answered as concisely as possible. They were halfway to the ranch when she said, Wait. Francis said we needed to buy supplies for me to cook tonight. Andrew sighed. I've already lost half a day's work just by driving into town to get you. I can't afford to lose any more. You'll have to make do with what we have. Tracy didn't try to speak again. Instead, she watched the trees go past as they drove. She knew the nearest large city to nowhere was San Antonio, and she wished she was closer to Fort Worth. It would have been nice to meet Susan, Elizabeth's sister. She already felt as if she were failing at marriage. What had she done wrong? Andy wanted to kick himself for actually marrying the girl. He should have married someone older and ugly if he'd wanted to keep his wits about him. He could already tell that Tracy was going to be difficult to be around. She was a chatterer. She asked too many questions, and she was too pretty for his comfort. He was already thinking about what it would be like to take her to bed, and he didn't want to think about that. She was there to keep house and cook. Anything else was just a side benefit and not something he should be thinking about during daylight hours. He couldn't believe how quickly Maddie had taken to her. 
he was certain he could have sent her home if not for that. Maddie had barely spoken to anyone outside the family since their parents' death. She'd been particularly close to their mother, and he worried about her every day. He didn't know how to give her what she needed to go back to being the loud, funny little girl she'd once been. He hoped that Tracy would help her come out of her shell. Tracy didn't know what she'd expected the ranch to look like, but she knew when she saw it that it was not what she'd envisioned at all. The house was not painted and needed to be badly. It was big, but not in the way Elizabeth's house had been big. Elizabeth's house was a perfectly manicured and cared-for piece of beautiful architecture. This house was, well, it looked like it had been designed by someone who had a few too many drinks before he picked up his pen. There seemed to be a main house that had been added on to in every direction over the years. There were other buildings throughout the yard, including what she assumed was maybe a chicken coop. She wasn't sure. She got down from the wagon, wishing she felt a little less stiff, but days on a train made for a really stiff body. Frances carried her bag for her and led her into the house, showing her around. She looked around for Andrew, but it seemed he'd already disappeared. Where had he gone so quickly? She was starting to think he didn't really want a wife after all. Frances set her bag down on the bed in the only downstairs bedroom. This is Andy's room. I cleaned out his top two drawers for your things. He smiled at her as if to tell her everything would be okay. Is Andy always this, grumpy? I would have thought he'd be excited for me to finally arrive. It's like he didn't want a wife. Francis turned red and looked at his feet, obviously trying to decide what to say. Well, he didn't. What? Then why did he send a letter out asking for one? Was there some kind of mix-up? What had happened? Francis sighed, his eyes meeting hers finally. I sent off the letter. We needed someone to cook and clean. I tried to talk Andy into finding a wife, but he said he didn't need one. I saw the advertisement in the paper a month or so ago, so I responded for him. I figured I'd be able to talk him into it before you got here, but I just told him last night. He shook his head. He was planning to send you home right up until Maddie got so excited to see you. He couldn't send you away then. Tracy sat down on the edge of the bed, staring off into space for a moment. He hadn't wanted her? No wonder he acted like she was a nuisance. She sighed. She was going to have to be the best darn bride a man had ever had to make him happy. She wanted to cry and scream that no one had ever wanted her. Not her mother, not the people at the orphanage, and now her husband didn't want her either. Instead, she stood up and opened her bag, removing her apron and pulling it down over her dress, tying it behind her back. She might as well get to work. The fact that her husband didn't want her didn't make her any less married, and she was going to be the best wife any man had ever seen. Tracy said nothing else to Frances as she hurried into the kitchen to check to see what the family had in stock. She hadn't eaten since early that morning on the train, and it was still several hours before supper, but she wasn't going to complain. It was her job to feed everyone. As soon as she walked into the kitchen, Maddie hurried in behind her. I don't have an apron, Tracy. Can I help cook without one? Tracy smiled down at the little girl, looking up at her so eagerly. It was a good thing she liked children, because it looked like this little girl was going to be permanently attached to her side. Of course you can. What do you want to make for supper? Maddie shrugged. We only ever eat bread that we buy in town and beef jerky. What do you know how to make? I know how to make a great many things. I helped in the kitchen at the orphanage where I've lived ever since I was a baby. Tracy looked around the sparse kitchen. Where is the food kept? she asked. There's a little food in the cellar, I think. Tracy nodded, looking around for the cellar door. She didn't see one. How do I get to the cellar? There's a door outside that leads down to it. 
Do you want me to show you? Yes, please. Tracy followed as the little girl led the way outside and to a big door on the side of the house. It's down here. Maddie opened the door for her, and Tracy led the way down, carefully leaving the door wide open for light, because she hadn't thought to bring a lantern. Once she got to the bottom of the short staircase, Tracy sighed with disbelief. How could anyone cook a decent meal with no real ingredients? There was no flour or sugar. No meat. The only things they seemed to have were beef jerky and crackers. She couldn't make a decent meal with those two ingredients. No one could. She thanked Maddie for her help and climbed the stairs out of the cellar. She needed to find Andy or at least find Francis. One of them could tell her how to hitch up the team to go get food. Right? Tracy found Francis first. He was leading the horses to their stall. Wait. Francis turned and smiled at her. Can I help you with something? Would you hitch the team back up for me? I need to go to town if I'm going to be able to cook supper tonight. There's nothing edible in the house except crackers and beef jerky, and that's not a meal I'm willing to serve. Francis's smile wavered for a moment. I don't think Andy would like for you to go into town by yourself. Not just yet. We have eggs and milk. Would those help? Tracy shrugged. Meat would help. Beans would help. I can butcher a chicken? Bring it to you? Tracy smiled and nodded. I'll take Maddie to collect eggs then, and we can make dinner from that. It won't be the best in the world, but it will be edible. She went back down to the cellar and took some of the crackers from the barrel, carrying them in her apron. After putting them on the only clean plate she could find, she took the egg basket off the hook by the door and went out to collect eggs, Maddie trailing behind her. Maddie knew all the good hiding places for eggs, and they were able to make quick work of it the task. Once they were back inside, Tracy rolled up her sleeves and started water boiling. She was relieved to see there was a pump in the kitchen so she wouldn't have to fetch water from a well. It should make things much easier. Maddie looked around the kitchen and tears welled up in her eyes. Do we have to wash all the dishes? Tracy laughed softly. I'm used to washing way more than this. In the orphanage where I grew up, we'd have as many as twenty children living there. I would do the dishes for everyone. We'll do them fast, and we'll get them done. Maddie sniffled slightly, but she helped clear the table to make the work quicker. The two of them worked together and had the table cleared and the dishes stacked in no time. While they worked, Tracy peppered Maddie with questions. Do you go to school in town? Maddie shook her head. There's no school close enough. Ma taught Andy, Francis, and Arthur, but she died before it was time to start teaching me. I'm sure Francis and Arthur could use a few more lessons as well. I'll sit all three of you down and teach you when fall comes. There's too much to do this summer. Tracy eyed the little girl. Her dress was too short, and her hair was in a sad way. I brought some pretty fabric with me. If we're careful, we'll have enough for us each to have a new dress. Would you like that? Maddie's eyes lit up at the prospect. The boys don't know how to sew, and Andy says we don't take charity from others. One of the women at church wanted to give me her daughter's dresses, but he wouldn't let me take them. Tracy sighed sadly. She'd worn used dresses her entire life. It was the way of the orphanage. They were given used dresses, and whoever the dresses fit would wear them until they didn't fit or wore out. If they could be worn by someone else, they were. If not, they went into the rag bag, and someone would be sleeping under them the next winter in the form of a quilt. Well, we'll make sure you have a pretty new dress just as soon as I can make it work. Maddie smiled. You really are going to be a good sister, aren't you? I'm going to try. She didn't know how she was going to make her peace with her new husband. He seemed to resent her, but she'd done nothing wrong. 
Why had Francis meddled that way? The door opened and Francis came into the kitchen with a freshly plucked chicken dangling from his hand. He'd taken the time to chop off the head and feet, which made it easier for Tracy to deal with. She'd have done it either way, but she thanked him for his help. As soon as they were finished with the dishes, Tracy wiped off the table and got down a large mixing bowl. She put the crackers she'd brought up into the bowl and used her hands to crush them. Maddie noticed what she was doing and giggled. May I help? Tracy hadn't thought of how much fun that would be to a child. My hands are getting tired, and I need to whip the eggs. Do you think you could finish crushing them all? Oh, yes. Maddie happily put her hands in the bowl and crushed the crackers while Tracy found another small bowl and a large pan. She whipped up the eggs with some salt and pepper. Tracy cut the chicken into pieces like she'd seen at the orphanage before Maddie was finished crushing the crackers. She sat for a moment looking around the room. She couldn't help but wonder if anyone had swept the house since their mother had died. It certainly didn't look like it. She had her work cut out for her. Even with Maddie's help, it was going to take a good week to have the house clean. The place was a pigsty. Maddie finished with the crackers, and Tracy showed her what they were going to do. She dipped a piece of chicken into the egg mixture and then rolled it in the cracker crumbs. I've never actually seen anyone cook chicken this way before, but I hope it will be good. She had seen some lard in the cellar, so she knew that she would have oil to fry it all in. Are there any potatoes? Maddie shook her head. No. We've only eaten crackers and beef jerky since Ma died. Tracy made a face. How could anyone exist on only those two things for over a year? Well, we'll have a better meal tomorrow night after someone takes the time to go into town for supplies. It's not too late in the year for us to start a garden either. We'll eat like kings come September. Tracy rushed back down to the cellar to get some lard and the two girls fried the chicken together. They would have nothing to eat with it, but at least it was something different than what they'd eaten for way too long. When the three men arrived home for dinner, Maddie and Tracy had set the table with a pretty tablecloth, and the chicken sat at the center of the table ready to be eaten. Andy took his place at the head of the table and peered at the chicken. What piece is that? he asked as he pointed with his fork at one of the pieces on the platter. And why does it look so funny? Tracy smiled sweetly at her new husband instead of kicking him as she wanted to do. I have no idea how to cut up a chicken. I did my best. It looks funny because there is no flour in this house. There are no ingredients of any sort that a reasonable person can make a meal with. So I did my best with what was available to me. Andy stabbed a piece as he bit the inside of his lip. He wasn't going to say another word about how funny the food looked. He was afraid his new wife would stab him in the throat with his fork if he did. He put the piece down onto his plate and looked at it for another minute. Let's pray. He bowed his head and his family followed suit. After their quick prayer, he took a bite of the odd-looking chicken and smiled. We may not have ingredients, but you did a good job on this chicken. Tracy nodded as the others all picked up their pieces and bit into them. Maddie said, this is the best thing I've eaten since Ma died. Francis and Arthur didn't speak because they were too busy stuffing food in their mouths. I'll still need to go to town tomorrow to buy supplies. You can go with me, or I'll go alone. I don't much care at this point. I can't keep making meals with no real ingredients. Andy swallowed the bite of food in his mouth. Now that I know you can cook like this, you'll have all the ingredients you want. Francis will ride into town with you tomorrow and help you. Francis used his sleeve to wipe his mouth. I'd be happy to. I'd also be happy to tell you what you should make and carry everything for you. Do you need more pots and pans? Tracy laughed. They were obviously all so starved for a decent meal, they were willing to do anything to keep them coming. 
She wasn't sure if they'd needed a wife in their house, but they'd certainly needed someone to cook and clean for them. I would love some help with everything tomorrow. After dinner, she and Maddie once again did the dishes, working together much more efficiently this time. Every bite of food had been eaten, but that didn't surprise Tracy. There hadn't been much to begin with. When she had real food at her disposal, she would make more. While the two girls cleaned, the others sat at the table and talked. Andy told the others what their work would be the following day. Arthur, you can help me with the fences, and Francis, you ride into town with the girls. Buy what she tells you to buy. I want to start eating like we used to when Ma was still around. He looked at the back of his wife's head. He was surprised she'd turned out to be what Francis had claimed she was. She was obviously a hard worker and a good cook. He needed to give her a chance instead of assuming she knew nothing because of her age. Once the dishes were done, Tracy took Maddie into her bedroom and showed her the fabric she had. I really think we can get two dresses out of this easily. Did your ma keep any dress patterns around? Maddie thought about it. She had a big box that she kept them in. Do you want the box? Yes, please. Where is it? Do you know? I think it's in the attic. Do you want me to show you? Yes, please. This time, Tracy had the foresight to get a lantern from the work table in the kitchen and take it with her. The two girls climbed to the upstairs, and Tracy peeked into the different bedrooms. Each was messier than the last. She took a deep breath. She could only do one room at a time, and the downstairs had to come first. Maddie showed her the box once they reached the attic, and Tracy smiled. That's exactly what I was looking for. They took it down the stairs and into the room Tracy would share with Andy. Hmm, I didn't bring any shears or anything. Do you have any? Tracy had always just used the sewing supplies at the orphanage. It had never occurred to her that she would need her own. Once Maddie brought her the scissors, Tracy thought of something else she needed. By the time they'd gathered all of the supplies together, it was time for the younger ones to go to bed. Tracy went up the stairs with Maddie and sat on the edge of her bed, talking to her softly about what they would do together. Tomorrow, we'll get the downstairs cleaned and we'll wash all the sheets. At the orphanage, they'd washed the sheets weekly, and Tracy didn't even want to think about how long it must have been since the Harveys had washed their linens. She'd strip all the beds and wash everything the next day. Maddie smiled. That sounds nice. I remember Ma doing all those things every week. Tracy was relieved to hear that the family was used to cleanliness when their mother was still alive. She would have been horrified to hear they'd lived this way all their lives. The orphanage hadn't ever had luxuries, but it had always been clean. Maddie smiled at Tracy, her eyes drooping. You'll still be here tomorrow, right? You won't go away? I won't go anywhere. Tracy kissed the little girl on her forehead and tiptoed from the room, closing the door behind her. Chapter 3 By the time Tracy joined the others downstairs again, Andy had sent Arthur and Francis to their beds. She sat down at the table beside him and brought up the one subject she felt was important they talk about before they slept that night. Francis admitted to me this afternoon that you had no idea I was on my way until last night. Andy leaned back in his chair and looked at her. Does that matter to you? Of course it matters to me. I would never have been part of your deception if I'd known it was happening. She shook her head. I can go back to Massachusetts if that's what you want. We don't have to stay married. He sighed heavily. We really don't have a choice at this point. Maddie would be very upset to lose you. As attracted to her as he was, he wasn't sure if he wanted her to stay or go. He didn't want to give her power over him, but he also didn't want to let her go. If it weren't for Maddie, would you send me back? Tracy didn't know where she got the confidence to ask the question, but she had to know. 
If he only wanted her, because she was good for his sister, could she stay? I honestly don't know. I told myself all the way into town I was going to send you back, no matter what, but I don't know if I could have done that with or without Maddie. I've never backed away from an obligation, and once Francis sent you that letter, you became my obligation. Tracy swallowed hard. The man she was sure was going to take one look at her and lose his heart thought of her as an obligation. Elizabeth, the woman who owns the mail-order bride agency in Beckham, said that she'd send me a train ticket to come back any time. I'll write to her tomorrow. Andy felt as if his heart dropped to his stomach. You want to leave? I don't want to stay where I'm not wanted. She couldn't do it again. They'd get an annulment, and Elizabeth would find her a man who actually wanted her in his life. How about this? Give it a little time. Say a month? And if at the end of a month, we don't think we're compatible, you go back home. She had no home, but she didn't say that aloud. I won't sleep with you in the meantime. Andy hadn't thought about that. I don't want my siblings to think there's something wrong between us. Share a bed with me, but I promise not to touch you. She raised an eyebrow at him. You won't? Because your bed isn't all that big. I won't touch you sexually. I'll sleep beside you at night. I might brush up against you, but nothing more. Tracy shrugged. Fine. Whatever you want. She stood up and walked toward the bedroom. Give me five minutes to change for bed. She didn't wait for an answer, but headed into the bedroom, shutting the door behind her. She leaned back against the door for a moment, letting the tears fall. What had she expected? That he would fall at her feet and beg her to stay? Tell her that after seeing her and tasting her marvelous cooking, he'd fallen in love with her and couldn't let her go? She brushed away the tears with the backs of her hands, before changing into her nightgown. Whatever he expected, she was going to do the right thing by his brothers and sister. She wouldn't make them suffer for how he felt. She was wearing her sleeveless, long, white nightgown and under the sheet with her eyes closed when he came into the room. She had her back to the center of the bed and didn't once open her eyes until he'd turned down the lantern and climbed into the bed beside her. Tracy? Yes? I'm sorry. I know you were led to believe something that wasn't true as well. We'll both make the most of it. His voice was soft and sympathetic, and it just made the tears fall more rapidly. Good night, Andy. She'd never call him Andrew again. Andrew was the man she'd been fantasizing about for the past month. The man who was going to sweep her off her feet and treat her like a princess. Andy was the reality. The man who didn't want her and never had. Asterisk. Tracy woke before the sun was up the following morning and quickly dressed in the dark. She knew it was almost time to get up because of how full her bladder felt and rushed to get ready for her day before her husband stirred. She may not be what he wanted in a wife, but she knew she was what his little sister needed. She'd concentrate on that, and not on the fact that she was once again unwanted and unloved. She went out to the henhouse and gathered more eggs, putting them into the basket. By the time she returned to the house, Andy was up and dressed. He nodded to her, obviously as uncomfortable around her as she now was around him. I'll need milk for breakfast. He nodded. I'm heading out to milk the cow now. Thank you. She turned away from him and started the fire in the stove so it would be hot enough for her to cook breakfast. She heard the door close behind him as she cracked the first of the eggs into a bowl. She had a lot of work to do that morning if she was going to be ready to go into town at a reasonable hour. All of the eggs were cracked and had been beaten by the time he came back in with a tin pail full of milk. She poured just a bit into the eggs and then stirred a bit more, before pouring them into the pan that she'd already melted a tiny amount of butter into. There was very little butter left in the house, and she added that she needed to make more to her mental list of things to be done. If she was only going to be there a month, 
she was going to make it the most productive month of her life. Maddie was going to know how to make basic meals before she left. The others appeared one by one as they smelled their breakfast cooking. Maddie's smile was huge as she rushed to Tracy's side, hugging her new sister tightly. You didn't leave. Tracy laughed kissing the top of the girl's head. I told you I'd be here when you woke up. She nodded to the stack of plates on the work table. Would you set the table for me? Pour everyone a glass of milk as well. I don't see any coffee around. She looked at Francis, ignoring Andy entirely, even though he sat at the table watching everything that went on around him. Do you drink coffee? Francis nodded. Andy and I both drink coffee, but we're both lousy at making it, so we gave it up after Ma died. We'll get some while we're in town today, then. She scooped the cooked eggs into a bowl and carried the bowl to the table, sitting down at the foot of the table, directly across from Andy. She knew it was where she needed to sit, but it would be hard to avoid his gaze through every meal. She'd do it, though. She had to. She couldn't look at him and not think about how stupid and utterly unlovable she was. Andy watched his new wife with a sad look in his eye. He almost wished he'd just lied to her the night before, instead of being so blunt about his lack of feelings. Why couldn't he have just gone along with it and treated her like he would treat a new wife? He'd missed out on a wedding night as a result of his idiocy, and it looked like he was going to lose her entirely. He had no one to blame but himself. He said the prayer for them before serving himself a heaping spoonful of the eggs. He knew that she must have used every egg she'd found to be able to have that many for them all. They hadn't had eggs since Ma had died, and he watched as his brothers devoured them. Even Maddie took a huge spoonful and all but fell on them. Tracy took a bite of the eggs and felt them stick in her throat. All she wanted to do was cry, but that would get her nowhere. What time will you be taking me to town today? She asked Francis. Andy shook his head. I changed my mind. I'll take you. Tracy met his eyes for the first time that morning. I'd really rather Francis took me, but thank you for offering. Andy blinked a couple of times, wondering if he'd heard her correctly. Was this the same woman who had worn her heart on her sleeve the previous evening? Francis is going to help mend fences. I think I need to be the one to drive you and introduce you around town. Tracy said nothing in response. She'd make certain Maddie sat between them the whole way there and back. The little girl would serve as the perfect buffer. After the dishes were washed and put away, Tracy sat down at the table and made a quick list of the things she felt they needed. She had so much she wanted to get done. She needed to teach Maddie the basics of cooking, so she wrote down all the basic ingredients. They'd start there. Once her list was done, she stood up and looked for Maddie. She found the girl upstairs, making her bed. Don't worry about that. We're going to wash the sheets and all the bedding when we get home from town. They needed to make the trip quickly so she could do the laundry and get the bread baked that day. Maddie turned from her bed and smiled at Tracy. I'm ready then. Her hair looked just as it had the day before. It was all snarled and dirty. Tracy couldn't do anything about how dirty it was then, but she'd wash it that night. She took the brush off Maddie's dresser and sat on the little girl's bed, inviting Maddie to sit on the floor at her feet. Tracy made quick work of the tangles in Maddie's hair. Within ten minutes, it was brushed out and braided into two long braids. There. Now you're ready. Maddie threw her arms around Tracy. Thank you. Tracy smiled. It certainly didn't take much to make Maddie happy. She wished her oldest brother was just as easy to please. They went down the stairs together. As soon as they reached the bottom, Tracy saw that Andy was there waiting for her. Are you ready to go? he asked. His eyes flicked over Maddie's hair and met Tracy's. Thank you, he mouthed. Yes, we're ready. 
She picked up her list from the table and followed him outside to where he already had the team ready to go. Tracy helped Maddie up to the center of the seat on the wagon before climbing in beside her. She looked straight ahead, not even willing to look at Andy. Maddie kept up a constant stream of chatter as they drove, talking about how much she loved going to town and how Sunday was her favorite day because she got to see her church friends, and even though they had to sit still, they were still fun. Tracy said little, except when asked a direct question by Maddie. Once they reached town, Tracy hurried down from the wagon and helped her new sister. She took Maddie's hand and went into the mercantile, looking around at all the wonderful things there. She had no idea how much she was allowed to spend, but since Andy hadn't felt as if she needed that information, she'd just spend what she thought she should and let him pay for it. Maddie led her straight to the proprietor of the store. This is my new sister, Tracy. Maddie announced, her face alight with happiness. The middle-aged man smiled at Tracy. It's nice to meet you, Mrs. Harvey. You just let me know if you have trouble finding anything. Tracy smiled and nodded. I will. Thank you. She turned from him and looked over the groceries he had to offer. She selected a large barrel of flour and another of sugar. Very quickly, she had a small mountain of food ready to purchase. Andy came in from outside where he'd been standing with the horses and looked at the pile. Is that all? he asked. Tracy shook her head. I need to get some yard goods to make Maddie some new dresses. Hers are too short. She looked over the fabrics in the corner of the store, picking out two different bolts of cloth and instructing the owner to cut some for her. When she was given the total, she blanched. She'd never heard of spending that much money all at one time, but Andy put his fingers into his shirt pocket and took out some money, paying the man quickly. She smiled at the owner as she left the store. Thank you for your help. You're welcome, Mrs. Harvey. You come back soon. Tracy tried not to giggle as she walked toward the wagon. Of course he wanted her to come back. There probably weren't a lot of people who bought that huge quantity of groceries all at once. They'd needed them, though, and she wouldn't apologize for doing the right thing by her family, even if they would only be her family for a short time. There were five or six men crowded around the wagon when she got out to it. She didn't say anything to them as she helped Maddie into her seat. May I help you up, ma'am? Tracy looked at the young man who'd offered. He wore a cowboy hat and an old beat-up pair of pants. He was obviously someone's ranch hand. That would be nice, thank you. My name is John. John Billings. I noticed your husband didn't help you down from the wagon when you got to town. When she said nothing he added, if you were my wife, I'd help you up and down every time. I'd treat you like a queen. It don't matter to me none that you've been married, either. I can kill him for you, and then I'll marry you. Tracy stifled a laugh. No, but I do thank you for your kind offer. She took his proffered hand and climbed into the wagon, sitting beside Maddie. I'd rather not be a widow, before I turn nineteen. John removed his hat and scratched his head. Just remember, there are a lot of men around here looking for wives. If you don't want to stay married to him, all you gotta do is close your eyes and point. We'd all treat you real good. Thank you, John. I'll keep that in mind if I decide that Andy doesn't treat me well enough. Andy came up just then and raised an eyebrow at John. You trying to steal my wife, John? You didn't help her down from the wagon. You must not love her. I'll treat her right. John didn't back down from his stance. Andy shook his head and climbed into the wagon. I treat her just fine. He waited until they were out of town before turning to Tracy. Why did you encourage him? Was she trying to make him jealous by letting other men touch her? Tracy's jaw dropped. Encourage him? All I did was accept a hand up into the wagon that you obviously weren't going to offer. Why do you say that? 
because I've gotten into the wagon three times in your presence and down twice. You've never offered to help me once. She stared off in front of them. He said if you don't treat me well enough to just let him know. There are plenty of men around here who are interested in marrying a good woman. Andy couldn't believe she would say that. Was she trying to make him angry? Maddie put her hand on Tracy's arm. But you're ours now, Tracy. You can't marry someone else. Tracy sighed, putting her arm around the little girl and hugging her close. Yes, I'm yours now. For how long, she didn't know, but she'd stay for the month agreed upon at least. She was glad to know that she wouldn't have a hard time finding another man in town to marry. It wouldn't have been easy to ask Elizabeth to send her that train ticket. Once they were home, Andy unloaded the wagon and carried everything inside. The only words spoken were him asking where she wanted certain items and her curt responses. Finally, he headed for the door. We usually eat lunch around noon. He closed the door behind him after saying those last words. Tracy looked at the clock on the mantel over the fireplace. It was eleven, so she had an hour. Thank heavens they'd left for town at seven that morning. If she hurried, she could have something ready for them. She and Maddie hurried as they made simple sandwiches for lunch and stripped all the beds, carrying the laundry out to wash and dry it. It wasn't even lunchtime and she felt as if she'd already put in a full day of work. It was a good thing she'd learned how to work hard at the orphanage. She wasn't sure how some of the girls she'd gone to school with would have handled the situation she was in. They simply didn't know how to work. After lunch, she and Maddie baked several loaves of bread, keeping the door and all the windows wide open. She'd heard stories of just how hot Texas was, and she hadn't really believed them until she'd tried to bake on a summer day. She was so hot, she felt as if she was going to melt into a puddle right there in her kitchen. After they got the bread from the oven, she taught Maddie how to make butter, and the two of them took turns at the butter churn. It was hard work, but it needed to be done, and she wanted Maddie to know how for when she was gone. She realized that she was acting as if leaving was a foregone conclusion. She assumed there was no way Andy would want to keep her at the end of the month, and why would he? He was dead set against having her for a wife. Did he not trust her because she wasn't from the South? Surely he knew the war had been over for twenty years. Asterisk. Andy worked hard that day, forcing his brothers to match the difficult pace he set. He kept thinking about John and how he'd made it very clear that he would be happy to take her for his wife if things didn't work out between Andy and Tracy. Why did the other man think he had the right to talk to another man's wife that way? What was wrong with him? By the time they went home that evening for supper, he was livid. He was certain Tracy must have done something to make the other man think she was unhappy in her marriage. When he walked into the house, he was barraged with smells. Good smells. There was a huge bowl of beans on the table that looked like they had bacon mixed through them and a plate of cornbread. He was almost mesmerized by the sights and smells of good food. How could he be angry with a woman who could cook? He washed up quickly and took his place at the head of the table. He waited until the others sat, bowed his head and said the shortest prayer he'd ever said in his life. Tracy sat bemused as she watched the four members of her new family attack the food like they'd never seen any before. She wasn't a huge fan of beans, because they had eaten them five nights a week at the orphanage but she could see the Harveys didn't have that same prejudice against beans. There was little talk as they all concentrated on their food. Finally, when every bite had been eaten, Andy leaned back in his chair and patted his stomach. That was the best meal I've had in a long time, he said with a sigh. Tracy shook her head. How did you four survive without someone to cook for you? Andy shrugged. We ate a lot of beef jerky. She stood up and walked to the oven, opening it up to remove the cake she'd hidden there. She really hadn't had time to bake that day, and had sacrificed the time she'd wanted to spend sewing, 
but it was worth it to see the three males' faces. Maddie had helped her frost it, so she'd known it was coming, but the other three looked shocked. Cake? You baked a cake? Tracy shrugged. I thought it would be good, since we just had beans for dinner. She served the cake and passed it out to everyone before starting to clear the table. Aren't you going to have any? Andy asked, looking at her with surprise. I will after the dishes are done. I'm not all that hungry right this second. She made quick work of clearing the table. By the time she got the first dish washed, Maddie was beside her holding her hand out to dry it. I'm sorry it took me so long to eat my cake, Tracy. I should have helped clear the table. Tracy smiled and shook her head. No, you should have enjoyed your cake. When Maddie beamed up at her, she said, we'll start on the first of your new dresses after we finish the dishes. Maddie all, but bounced up and down. I'd like that. Tracy kept her ears open to the voices behind her. Once again Andy let the others know what they would be working on the next day. Tomorrow is branding, he said. Arthur groaned. I hate branding. The smell is awful. Get used to it. We're a ranching family, so we brand the cattle. No choice. He collected all the plates and took them over to Tracy, trying to do his best to get on her good side once again. Thank you for supper. It was wonderful. Would she forgive him? Tracy said nothing, just nodding in acknowledgement of his words as she took the plates from him. She put them into the hot water she was washing the dishes with and kept up her work. Andy sighed as he took his seat at the table again. He'd talk to her after the others were in bed. With the way she cooked, he knew he wanted to keep her. He regretted his words from the previous night a great deal. As soon as the dishes were done and put away, Tracy went into her bedroom and brought out the fabric they'd purchased. She carefully used the pattern and cut out the pieces for the first dress. Explaining what she was doing to Maddie through each step and letting the younger girl help where she could, she hoped to teach her to be able to take charge of her home when she left. She knew it was a tall order for a young girl, but Maddie seemed willing to learn all she could. They had the dress completely cut out by the time she needed to send Maddie to bed. She once again walked up the stairs with her and waited while the girl changed into her nightgown and then sat on the edge of her bed. Maddie smiled at her. Thank you for the best day I've ever had. Tracy smiled. The day had been difficult for her, knowing that she was not wanted and never had been. She'd fought through it though and could see by the girl's face that it was a good thing she had. We'll do so much more tomorrow. She leaned down to kiss her forehead. I'm going to teach you to sew tomorrow. Maddie smiled, nodding as her eyes drooped. Thank you for making my bed so clean. They'd managed to wash all the sheets and quilts while the men had been working during the day. Tracy was really proud of all they'd accomplished. They weren't anywhere near done with the cleaning, but they'd made a good start. In a week, the house would look like it should and they'd be able to devote more of their time to sewing. Chapter 4 Once again, the boys were in bed by the time Tracy made it back down the stairs. She automatically gathered up the pieces of the dress they'd cut out so she could put them away. She didn't want to have to deal with any messes first thing in the morning. Once she was finished, she said, Good night. Before she could close the door to their bedroom, Andy called, Wait. I want to talk to you before you go to bed. He'd been thinking about what he wanted to say to her ever since he'd gotten home and seen supper sitting on the table. Tracy put the things in her hands onto the dresser and walked back into the kitchen, sitting down across from him. What do you want to talk about? Andy stood up and moved so they were sitting closer together. Tracy considered standing up and moving further away from him, but she wasn't going to be that childish. I'm sorry I got angry with you in town today. I know that John likes to flirt with every woman he meets, so I shouldn't have blamed you for what he said and did. Tracy shrugged, not liking him sitting so close. 
She felt herself drawn to him, as she'd imagined she would be when she first agreed to move to Texas as his bride. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. I said some things to you that I shouldn't have last night. I can see Francis was right. I do need a wife. You've already made my home so much better than it was. I want you to stay. It wasn't easy for him to ask her to stay after the things he'd said. He felt as if there was a giant lump in his throats that the words had to force their way around. I will stay until my month is up, just like I promised. She got to her feet and pushed the chair back under the table. Andy didn't think about what he was doing, he just acted to keep her in his life. His hand reached out and grabbed her by the wrist, pulling her down into his lap. He slipped his arms around her and nuzzled her neck. That's not what I'm saying, he whispered into her ear. Tracy stiffened. What are you doing? Hadn't they decided he wasn't going to touch her just the night before? What was his problem? Andy smiled. What does it feel like I'm doing? I'm kissing my wife. He drew her head down to his, and he kissed her softly. I've wanted to do that again ever since I kissed you at our wedding. You have a strange way of showing it. Tracy tried to keep her voice disapproving, but she couldn't. She liked what he was doing to her too much. She felt like melting into his lap. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Marrying you was the right thing to do. Tracy shrugged. I'm not so sure. Did he decide it was the right thing to do because he had a decent dinner? Or because the house was clean for a change? She knew he wasn't overwhelmed by her beauty, because that would have happened the day before. Andy cupped her face in his hands and drew her down for another kiss, their first real kiss. He kissed her gently, his lips toying with hers. His tongue probed at her lips, asking for permission to enter her mouth. She let out a low moan and parted her lips, granting him access. Turning her torso so she was facing him fully, she put her hands on his shoulders. She may not like Andy, but she certainly liked his kisses. What was wrong with her that she wanted to be kissed by a man who made it clear he didn't want her in his life? He moved his hands up and down her back as his tongue gently explored the inside of her mouth. He pulled her closer to him with her body flush against his. Tracy was out of breath when she finally broke the kiss, looking into his brown eyes. I don't think this is a good idea. We're married. Why isn't it a good idea? I'm leaving in a month. The answer should be obvious. Had he forgotten their agreement? Andy shook his head. I don't want you to go. I want you to stay here with me and be a real wife to me. Because I'm a good cook? She jumped up from his lap as if he were on fire. I don't think so. Good night, Andy. She rushed from the room and into their bedroom, pulling her nightgown on as quickly as she could. She wasn't going to agree to stay after the way he'd made it clear he didn't want her the night before. She got into bed and covered herself with the sheet, taking up the smallest place possible. She didn't want to accidentally touch him in her sleep. Andy sat still for a moment after she left, his body still worked up by their kiss. There was such passion between them that he was shocked she'd been able to run off that way. He groaned. How was he going to spend the night in the same bed with her feeling as worked up as he was without touching her? It would be impossible. He groaned, walking into the bedroom he shared with her and undressing, noting she was already lying on her side facing away from the center of the bed, just as she had the night before. He'd had the courtesy to wear a nightshirt the previous night, but he wasn't going to do that again. He preferred to sleep in nothing, and his little bride could just get used to that fact. Texas summers were too hot for nightshirts. He slid between the sheets, debating whether or not he should touch her. He wanted to. He wanted to pull her into his arms and make sweet love to her, making her forget that she wanted to be anywhere in the world other than in his arms. Instead, Andy shifted to the center of the bed and put his arms around her, 
drawing her back against him. He didn't try to kiss her again, but he could feel by the rigidness of her body that she expected him to. He wrapped his left arm around her waist, not touching her anywhere that she would deem inappropriate and closed his eyes, hoping he'd be able to get at least a little sleep. Tracy couldn't figure out what it was that Andy wanted. Was he going to try to make love to her? When he did nothing but hold her in the darkness, she slowly relaxed and let herself enjoy the feeling of being held. No one had ever touched her in a way that made her feel like she was special. She'd never really meant anything to anyone. That's why his rejection had hurt so badly. Finally, she relaxed enough to sleep, his arm still around her. Andy lay awake long after Tracy fell asleep. He had to find a way to convince her that she'd done the right thing marrying him. It wasn't only his siblings who needed her now. It was him. He had to get her to stay. He wanted to kick himself for his rude words of the previous night. Asterisk. Tracy awoke, the next morning, to the feeling of a bug against her cheek. She reached up to swat it away, but instead encountered fingers there. Her eyes opened wide with surprise. Andy was waking her. Is it time to get up? She asked, yawning, and hoping he'd let her go. Her nightgown had ridden up during the night, and she could feel the front of his thighs against the back of hers. Her bottom was barely covered, and she felt something poking her. She didn't ask what it was. She was afraid to. Not quite time to get up, he whispered. I thought it would be nice to start our day alone together. He pulled back a little and turned her onto her back. You're beautiful. He hadn't been able to help noticing how beautiful she was even when she'd gotten off the train dirty and tired. Now though? She made his heart beat faster. She was perfect in his eyes. The moon was full and streaming in through the window. The sun hadn't come up yet, but she knew that it would shortly. I don't think this is a good idea, Andy. She wanted to tell him to kiss her. She wanted to spend time holding him and stroking him. It wasn't a good idea, though, because he didn't really want her. He only wanted the food she made. What's not a good idea, he asked as his fingers trailed along her cheek. He leaned down and very lightly brushed his lips against hers. This? His hand found her breast through her nightgown. Or this? Tracy moaned her lips, clinging to his. She knew she should just jump out of bed and run to the kitchen, but he felt so good against her. How could she leave him? She turned to him more fully instead, putting one hand at the back of his neck as he kissed her. She wanted to stay here with him all day. Andy's hand gently squeezed her breast, his thumb toying with her nipple through the fabric of her nightgown. She splayed her hands across his back. Would staying be so bad? She liked it here. She liked him when he wasn't telling her he didn't want her there. From outside the door, she heard a loud whisper. Tracy, it's time to start breakfast. I'll collect the eggs. Maddie. How could she have forgotten about Maddie? Tracy sighed against his lips, pulling back from Andy. Maddie's up. I need to get dressed. She rolled away from him, silently thanking Maddie for the interruption. If she had stayed in bed with her husband much longer, there would be no question of whether she could leave or not. She would have to stay. Andy propped himself up on his elbow and watched his new wife gather her clothes for the day. He waited to see if she'd remove her nightgown in front of him. He'd already gotten a tantalizing glimpse of her bare thigh when she'd climbed from the bed. She looked over her shoulder at him. Would you turn your back, please? Andy smiled. At least she was being polite to him. No, I really don't think I will. You're my wife, and I have every right to see you unclothed. Tracy blushed. You get dressed first then, and I'll wait. He chuckled at that. I'm not wearing anything under this sheet. You sure you want me to dress first? She squeezed her eyes closed tightly and sat on the bed. Yes, 
please. He laughed out loud. His hand rubbed her back through her nightgown. One day, you'll be happy to see me naked. Please hurry, she suggested. I need to start breakfast. She wasn't about to comment on his statement about seeing him naked. He rolled from the bed and dressed quickly. He didn't have any more time to torment his wife. He needed to get dressed and get the cow milked. When he was fully clothed, he leaned down and kissed her one last time. I'll see you at breakfast. As soon as the door closed behind him, Tracy jumped up and pulled her clothes on. She couldn't believe he'd been so brazen in front of her. What was he thinking? He had suddenly turned into a different man than the sullen man she'd married. She wasn't sure if she liked him this way. Once she was dressed, she went into the kitchen and started a fire in the stove, putting the frying pan on the top with a little bit of butter to melt. She quickly mixed up everything she needed for pancake except the eggs, and as soon as Maddie was in the house with the eggs, she added three. Good morning, Maddie. We're having pancakes this morning. Oh. That sounds lovely. Maddie flew into Tracy's arms and hugged her tightly. Ma used to make pancakes for breakfast every Sunday morning. She said they were the only thing that would fill us up enough to sit still through church. Tracy laughed. I'm excited to meet everyone at church. Tomorrow's Sunday, isn't it? She couldn't believe she'd lost track of the days, but she'd been on the train so long. Maddie giggled. Yes, it is Sunday. I want you to meet my friends. Tracy smiled at the girl. No one had ever looked up to her the way Maddie did. She was going to have a hard time saying goodbye to her. I can't wait to meet them. Maddie set the table and put the butter and syrup on while Tracy made the pancakes. She made a pot of coffee for everyone who drank it, knowing she'd probably drink coffee and milk both. She couldn't meet Andy's eyes again that morning but it was for a different reason than the previous morning. She would tell him that night there couldn't be a repeat of that morning in bed. After breakfast, she jumped up to start the dishes, mentally going over everything she would have to do that day. She wanted to finish cleaning the downstairs of the house before starting on the upstairs the next day. She wanted to get all the windows washed and the walls scrubbed. Tracy knew Maddie was going to be her little helper. She had just put the stack of plates into the dishwater to wash when Andy put his hand on her shoulder. When she turned to see what he wanted, he leaned down and kissed her senseless. The kiss was hard, but the warmth spread through her body quickly. Andy pulled back and plopped his hat onto his head. Have a good day. He was gone before Tracy could find the words to respond. Maddie grinned up at her. He likes you, she whispered. Tracy giggled softly. He is certainly starting to make me think that. Asterisk. With the day's chores finally finished, Tracy sat down with Maddie and showed her how to make simple stitches. She gave her two scraps of the fabric they'd used for her new dress with the instructions to sew them together so they could make a purse out of them. Andy found them that way at the end of the day. He and his brothers had put in a long day of work and they were all three exhausted. Walking into the house, smelling dinner cooking, and seeing even the windows shining as if they were brand new rejuvenated him. He glanced over and saw Tracy sitting with Maddie, both of their heads bowed over their sewing. He didn't know what Maddie was making, but Tracy had told him the day before she was going to make Maddie a new dress and have it done as soon as she could. The girl needed dresses that fit for church. He washed his hands and walked over to where they sat, smiling down at them. My two ladies, hard at work. Tracy looked up and rolled her neck. Let me put dinner on the table. They were later than she'd expected, so she'd shoved everything into the cooling oven to keep it warm while she and Maddie sewed. Andy caught her around the waist before she could walk away, kissing her softly. She looked up at him with wide round eyes. Would he grab her and kiss her every chance he got? It certainly seemed that way. 
and she definitely didn't have it in her to complain. She rushed to pull dinner from the oven and put it on the table. Everything was set. Maddie got the milk and poured it for everyone, while Tracy put the big bowl with pot roast, carrots, and potatoes onto the center of the table. She'd baked some fresh dinner rolls and they were cooling on the work table. She piled them into a bread basket and put them out as well. Once she'd taken her seat, she bowed her head, waiting for Andy to pray. The family ate more slowly this time, obviously getting used to the fact that there would be good foods to sustain them for a while. After his first bite, Andy looked at Tracy, his eyes twinkling. This is delicious. I never would have thought Francis would be so good at picking out a wife. Tracy blushed. He's a smart young man. Polite, too. We'll find him a wife soon. Francis choked on his pot roast. I'm not quite ready to marry yet. I'm only sixteen. Tracy smiled, winking at Andy. I have just the girl in mind. She was one of the girls in the orphanage. You don't mind an older woman, do you? She was teasing him, of course, because there had been no girls even close to her age at the orphanage. Most girls were adopted as soon as they were old enough to be considered helpful around someone's home. She hadn't been up for adoption because of the letter left in her basket. Francis's eyes were wide with panic as he shook his head. I need to wait until I'm at least twenty-five to marry. Andy looked at Francis. You didn't think I should wait that long. Andy could tell that Tracy was teasing his brother, so he decided to help. But that was different. I was about to start clubbing you over the head with beef jerky if we didn't get a decent meal. Francis took another bite of his potatoes as he talked. Andy chuckled. We did eat a lot of beef jerky. Yes, we did. Way too much. Arthur said, making a face. If I'd had to eat beef jerky one more time, I don't know what I would have done. Killed me? Andy asked with a smile. He knew his family had been sick of beef jerky, but they'd rarely complained about it to him. They'd all known he was doing the best he could with what he had available. At least you were smart enough to marry Tracy. She's pretty, smart, and she can cook. Arthur said. It's about time you did something right. Tracy stifled a giggle at the banter. The younger brothers had always been so respectful of Andy that she was genuinely surprised to hear them talk that way. Andy's eyes met Tracy's. Smartest thing I ever did. Tracy blushed, not believing he was talking that way. Maybe he was genuinely starting to have feelings for her. More likely he was trying to find a way to get her to stay and keep cooking. After dinner, she and Maddie did the dishes, while the boys relaxed around the table. Sunday was a day of rest, so only necessary chores would be done. Tracy was glad. Her body was starting to ache with the constant work she was doing. Having a day off would be good for her. After the dishes were finished, she put a pot of beans on to soak. She'd cook them on low the whole time they were at church, so they'd have a meal ready when they got home. Maddie ran to get their sewing, and the two of them sat in rocking chairs working, while the three boys sat around the table and played a game with a deck of cards. Once everyone was in bed, and she'd put her sewing away for the night, Andy asked her to sit and talk with him at the table again. She took the seat next to him, but made sure she was out of arm's reach. She needed to talk to him as well. She waited for a minute for him to say something. When he didn't, she broached the subject she wanted to talk about. I think you should keep your hands to yourself until I go. I don't want to risk doing something that would keep us from being able to easily dissolve our marriage. Not really, but, she couldn't stay with things between them as they were. Andy sighed heavily. Do you really think we're going to be able to easily dissolve our marriage regardless? We're not, you know. Why not? I've seen how you are with Maddie. You can't tell me you're not going to love her. 
We're all going to be on the floor hugging your legs, begging you not to leave us like a group of toddlers whose mother is about to run away forever. He shook his head. Tracy smiled at the picture his words painted in her mind. You will? That could be interesting. He scooted his chair closer to hers, taking her hand in his and bringing it to his lips. I know I wasn't kind to you your first day here. I was still in shock that Francis had sent for a wife without even telling me. He looked into her eyes, trying to make her understand. Now that I've gotten to know you a little, I realize that I want you to stay. Please say you'll stay with me. He needed her to agree to stay for him, not for his siblings, but he didn't add that. With the way he'd behaved, he had no right to ask for that. What will I do when you change your mind again and decide that life was better before you married me? She shook her head. No one has ever wanted me around. My mother dumped me on the steps of an orphanage when I was a few weeks old. The people in the orphanage took care of me, because that's what people in orphanages do. Every friend I ever had got adopted as soon as we became close. She pushed the strands of hair that had fallen out of her bun away from her face. I can't stay here with someone else who doesn't want me. Andy closed his eyes for a moment, regretting the pain he'd caused her. I'm sorry I added to the pain you already felt. I never meant to do that. Please stay with us. We all want you to stay and be part of our family. He scooped her out of her chair and pulled her into his lap. Me most of all. His lips met hers before she could answer him, and this time, his kiss wasn't filled with passion. It was a healing kiss, letting her know with his actions that he truly was sorry for the things he'd done. She sighed against his lips, her hands going to his shoulders, to keep steady. When she lifted her head, she was seriously considering his words. She wanted so badly to be wanted and needed by someone that she was willing to grasp at straws to get there. I don't know. He pulled her face down for another soft kiss, sensing that she was softening. Please. I'll get down on my knees and beg if you need me to. He couldn't imagine letting her go. It wasn't just the cooking. She was a pretty, intelligent, loving woman. He needed her for his sister and his brothers. More importantly, though, he needed her for himself. She leaned down and initiated a kiss with him for the first time ever, her lips dancing across his. You don't have to beg. I'll stay. She sank against him, not realizing until then that she'd been holding herself rigid on his lap, so as little of her body would touch his as possible. As soon as she agreed, she snuggled close to him. He took one of her legs and lifted it over his lap to the other side of his hips. She was then facing him on his lap, and he pulled her down closer to him, deepening the kiss and stroking her soft curves. Thank you, he whispered against her lips. Tracy was surprised at how intimately she could feel him through their clothes. They shouldn't be touching this way in the kitchen. Even she knew that. What if one of the children came down the stairs for a drink of water? She blushed at the very idea. Pulling her head up, she said, I'm going to get ready for bed. Give me five minutes? She asked. He shook his head. I'm not letting you out of my sight. I'm afraid you're going to change your mind. He helped her off his lap and got to his feet, holding her hand tightly in his as he led her to their bedroom. I made a promise. I don't go back on my promises. Tracy tried to push him out the door so she could undress. I trust you. I just don't want to let you go. He kicked the door shut and kissed her gently, his hand stroking up and down her arms. Let me help you get ready for bed. Tracy pulled back and looked at him in surprise. I know how to change into my nightgown. Andy smiled, his lips toying with hers once more. You're not going to wear a nightgown tonight, sweetheart. She was surprised to hear him use the endearment. Sure, she knew he wanted her in his bed, and he wanted her to cook for him and his brothers and sister, but sweetheart? Really? 
I couldn't sleep without a nightgown. She was embarrassed at the very idea. Sleeping naked is freeing. Trust me. His hands went to the buttons at the front of her gown and slowly worked them out of their holes. Once he was finished, he spread the bodice of her dress wide open, looking at her in just her petticoat and corset. He pushed the dress off her shoulders, his hands smoothing over her. You wear too many clothes, he whispered. She blushed, swallowing hard. I wear the same amount as any decent woman. He chuckled. But at night, when there's no one around but us, I want you to be indecent. He pulled her to him again, kissing her passionately, his hands going behind her to work at the strings of her corset. He'd never helped a woman out of her clothes, or seen one with nothing on before, and his hands were shaking as he helped this woman remove her undergarments. Tracy stood docilely, enjoying his kisses and allowing him to undress her. She felt she was being naughty allowing him to get so close to her, but she also knew he was her husband and had the right to touch her in any way he wanted. He dropped the corset to the floor and pushed the strap of her petticoat off her shoulder. Your skin is like velvet. His lips trailed across her cheek, his tongue licking at the place where her neck and shoulder met. She shivered in the hot night air. A jolt of feeling shot right through her body and she sighed as she leaned her head to the side to give him better access. I really should put my nightgown on. She felt the need to protest one last time, but she hoped he wouldn't agree. What he was doing to her felt so good she never wanted it to stop. He pushed the petticoat off her shoulders into a pool on the floor and she stood before him wearing nothing. She'd taken off her socks and shoes much earlier, because it was so much cooler to go without. His hands roamed up and down her nude body, cupping her buttocks and pulling her against him. I want you, he whispered against her lips. Tracy hadn't realized until that moment that he was still fully clothed while she stood nude before him. She slowly unbuttoned his shirt, not knowing if she was being too brazen, but she wanted to be able to touch him like he was touching her. She slid her fingers inside his shirt once it was unbuttoned and toyed with the smooth skin there. Andy scooped her up into his arms and carried her the few feet to the bed, coming down beside her, pressing his lips to hers. You are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, he whispered softly. I can't believe you're going to stay here with me forever. Tracy smiled, her hand going up to stroke his cheek. I've always needed to be wanted. Here, I feel like I'm needed. Like I'm important to people. His fingers danced across her bare breast, taking her nipple between his thumb and forefinger and toying with it gently as he lowered his head for another kiss. We do need you. All four of us. His hands overwhelmed her as they stroked her wildly. She wanted nothing more in the world than to be loved by this man. She wasn't sure yet what she felt for him but she knew he was her husband, the man she was going to spend the rest of her life with, so nothing less than love would do. As he gathered her to him and made her his wife, she clung to his broad shoulders, kissing him passionately. Afterwards she lay in his arms, snuggled close to him. Did I hurt you? he asked. She shook her head. Truthfully there had been a little pain, but mostly it had felt simply glorious. Now she kissed his chin. I'm glad it was you I married and not someone else. He sighed, hugging her close, his hands unable to stop roaming over her body even though he was now sated. I am too. As she closed her eyes, she had a smile on her face. She would be going with him to church in the morning as his true wife.